All right, well, good morning, and we are back in 1 Timothy. Uh, yesterday was quite interesting as we were taking a look at the qualifications for people in the church. I have to tell you, for ordained ministers, those were pretty strict qualifications. Not that I'm saying we shouldn't have them. We definitely do need to. Uh, if anything, we've lightened up on those qualifications today. Um, and probably not for the better either. Um, but I would say this, the way Paul ties things together with the great mystery, the mystery of godliness, the mystery of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the word taking on flesh and dwelling among us, this mystery is what we preach. It is the salvation of the world is through Jesus Christ. And that's the mystery Paul is saying has now been revealed. So I also find it interesting. He ends chapter three with delineating the aspects of this mystery, right? God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. A whole litany of the mysteries that are our salvation. And then he's going to go into the great apostasy again. We touched on that in Thessalonians. But chapter 4, I find it interesting that there's a contrast between the end of chapter 3 with the mystery of our hope of salvation, of godliness, and then the mystery of iniquity. The great apostasy. What we should be seeing in the world or would be is what he is now going to show us. So let's take a look at that after a word of prayer. Father, again, we settle our hearts this morning as we come before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are so good to us, that you love us so much that you died on the cross for our eternal salvation. You healed us, Lord, from our sin, and we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for these beautiful days you're giving to us, for the birds and the flowers and all of creation, Lord, your handiwork. And Father, you did it all for us. So help us to be good caretakers of this world, good caretakers of one another, and stir our conscience and our hearts with your holy fire, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's the contrast. Paul gives us this mystery of godliness at the end of chapter 3, and then he begins chapter 4 in 1 Timothy this way. Now the Spirit expressly says... That in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. There's a lot in these statements. Number one, Paul says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith. Well, what spirit is that? <clears throat> That's the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is making a point here. He's expressly saying to you, okay, Open your eyes, open your ears, listen, look, and see what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. That in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Why will they depart? They're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, I have to tell you, this is one of the clearest places in Scripture that gives us an affirmation of the spiritual world around us. 
that there are such beings known as angels and demons, that there is a spiritual world that runs parallel to this one that you and I live in. And we interact, right? Remember in the creation we're told that man was made a little lower than the angels, but a little higher than the animals. And because we're in between, we can touch both worlds. The animal world, because we're flesh and blood in here, but the spiritual world as well, because we are also spiritual beings and have our etiology, our, our origin in God. So we see this affirmation here. And not only that, but he's saying that there will be people who are going to depart from the faith precisely because the evil spirits, the demons and the deceiving spirits will deceive them. So there are actually influences that we can sustain from the spiritual beings that can cause us to kind of lean one way or the other with regard to truth or especially the teachings in the church have you ever thought of that it's quite interesting isn't it however i will say this the deceiving spirits and demons that Paul is talking about here, those are fallen angels. And so I want us to balance this out by understanding that if fallen angels can influence us, so can the good angels, your guardian angel. You know, the book of Hebrews does tell us and implies that our angels are always beholding the face of God, meaning Every human being in the world is assigned a guardian angel. And we don't think about our guardian angel that much, do we? You should, you know? I think there was an old prayer my mother used to say, Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits us here, ever this day be at my side to keep and guard to rule and guide. Amen. I think that's how it went. My mother used to pray that often, and, and she said it was for the guardian angel. Um, and we should kind of cultivate that relationship only because we never acknowledge the angel, and yet the angel is always with us, trying to help us and protect us and praying for us. Now, these angels, the fallen angels, right, the deceiving spirits and demons teach doctrines, which are teachings. So apparently they're deceptive and they try to introduce teachings into the church that cause people to fall away. It's always a red flag for you and for me when somebody comes up with a new understanding of who Jesus is or a new teaching that the church had apparently missed for the past 2,000 years, but they've discovered it and we should learn it now. Yeah, I'd be a little bit worried about that. Because we are in a warfare. As the apostle said in Ephesians, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And these principalities and powers very much so seek to intimidate, confuse, teach us error, get us angry and infuriated. Everything they do is to pull us away from godliness away from Jesus Christ, away from the word of God and truth. So that's our battle. And that's why we pray. And that's why we trust God to give us the grace and the strength to see these things. So Paul 
is letting us know that the Spirit of God, God himself, is expressly saying that in the latter times, and we're in the latter times, we've always, ever since Jesus came, it's been the latter times, right? Uh, so in the latter times, many are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. And he gives a descriptive here, beginning at verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. And there's a lot of people that do that. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? Well, these teachers, the ones who are being influenced by the teachings of demons, right? are teaching lies in hypocrisy. They're, they're telling you to, to live one way and they're probably living the opposite, right? They're telling you, uh, you know, things that are hypocritical. And then he says, their, their own conscience seared with a hot iron. It doesn't bother them to teach error. It doesn't bother them to dissuade you from the historic Christian faith. Why? Because their conscience has been seared over with a hot iron. Um, if you have no conscience and it doesn't bother you anymore. You know, we can take an example. Think of something drastic that would bother your conscience. You know, if, if I were to, uh, you know, steal the baby bottle from a baby who's hungry and make it go all night without eating while it cried and cried and cried. Could my conscience be okay with that? No, absolutely not. It'd be a dreadful, awful thing to do. But if I really hated that baby or the person who had that baby and I really didn't care about that baby and I've done it before, I'll do it again, eventually, you will sear your conscience. Your conscience will begin to not bother you so much. Another example, because once we continue to sin or do something evil, right, it gets easier, not harder. At first, our conscience is very sensitive to right and wrong. But the more we do it, the easier it is to do. So, especially with things like lying, right? Or stealing. I might steal a pack of gum from the store the first time. I feel dreadful about doing it, but I didn't get caught. I do it again. Still feel a little bad, but I can get caught. Eventually, it's easy. You just do it. I don't feel bad at all. I'm looking forward to the gum. That's what ends up happening to you. When you continue to defile your conscience, it doesn't bother you anymore. Its voice is no longer heard in your being. And so this conscience of this person who's, be, who's teaching the doctrines of demons, right, is seared with a hot iron. They're not feeling anything anymore. It's been so, you know, deadened that they don't feel bad about what they're teaching. And then he gives a list of some of the teachings, forbidding to marry, Commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So, in the ancient world and even in our modern world, there are cults and groups out there that have particular doctrines or teachings with regard to things like what you can eat, um, whether you can be married or not. There are cult groups that tell a husband and wife that they no longer are each other's, but they need to share themselves with a lot of people. Or they say the marriage cannot happen, so you need to leave your wife or leave your husband and join the cult. And marriage is not, we don't have marriage in this cult, right? So those are things that the cults back then and even today teach. Also, the forbidding... Uh, of certain foods, the abstaining from certain foods. Now, that does not mean, you know, Christian practices of like not eating meat on Good Friday or in Lent or something like that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about some of those um, cults and some teachings that tried to come in saying 
you know, all meat is bad for you. We should all be vegetarians. That's how God created us. Meat itself is just, you know, it's, it's cruel to the animals, number one. And number two, it's not good for us. So we need to be vegetarians. Well, that's a lie. God created all things very good. And yes, animals are there for us to consume as well as vegetables. We're just not to abuse, right? We're not to abuse the amount and we're not to abuse animals. And we certainly shouldn't abuse the earth by, you know, raping and pillaging the earth of all its vital resources. There needs to be a balance and moderation in all things. But the use is not in question. God has provided these things for us. You may choose not to. You may choose not to eat meat anymore and be a vegetarian. That's your choice. And that's fine. But don't say God commands everyone abstain from meat. Because that is not true. And that's one of the lies of the evil one. What else does he say here? He says in verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It is sanctified. It is cleansed, right? By the word of God and prayer over your food. Pray at dinner. Ask God to bless the meal. Thank him for the food that he's provided for you. And that's it. He'll cleanse it. There's no more evil aspect to it. It is cleansed and ready for you. The word of God and prayer can do all of that. It's a good reason why we pray at meals, right? We do it not just for thanksgiving to God, but because in the ancient days... They were afraid that the meat they picked up in the market might have been sacrificed to an idol, right? So maybe the butcher was a worshiper of the goddess Diana, and he sacrificed a bull to Diana that morning. And then he cut up the meat and he sold it in the marketplace. So here's a, a bull, right? Your, your prime rib steak was uh, sacrificed to a, a, a pagan god. And it was involved in that ritual. Well, that's not going to sit right with you, knowing that. So what do you do? Paul says, don't worry about it. Buy this prime rib steak and just pray over it. Thank God for it. Pray over it. And you're good to go. It's really that simple, to be honest with you. So we shouldn't worry. And, and yes, we should pray before our meals, pray over our meals and with one another. And give thanks to God. Because he is good. Always he is good to us. So these are some of the teachings, right? And, and he says in, in verse 5, For it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. That's a beautiful message to us. Now verse 6, he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. So to be a good minister is to instruct, teach the faith, teach the church, much like I'm doing now to you. And he's saying, teach them the good doctrine, right? The, the correct truth, the stuff that God gave us to teach. Be faithful in that. And he says, teach the good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. The world is always going to try to add things to the church, to add teachings to the church. When culture changes, well, by golly, we have to change with it. And all the truth must change. So if grandma's generation believed Jesus was born of a virgin and that he's fully God and fully man, and my generation doesn't believe that, well, by golly, we're going to change that. No. You cannot do that because those are eternal 
truths. And we are to carefully teach those, carefully preserve those. One thing is for sure, it is not going to make you, not going to make you a popular person in this world. Never does. Jesus said to his followers when he was with them, if don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. Servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Now we live in a day and an age where we're not being outright persecuted, at least in this country. However, Christians are in other parts of the world. Many missionaries will tell you that. We see it on the news. In other parts of the world, Christians are being persecuted and martyred. And so we ought to remember that truth, God's truth, is very valuable and is also something that must be carefully given to others to make sure that we're teaching the correct truths because there are good teachings and there are bad teachings. And these two are going to try to come together at some point and the teacher has to discern right from wrong, good from evil, truth from error, light from darkness. Does it make sense? And so we try to be careful what we teach. He says in verse 7, But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Old wives' fables. That's interesting. Um, interesting Paul would, would bring that up because he's talking about the gossips and the gossiping stories that you hear. He calls them fables, right? Which they really are. I mean, gossip has very little. It's, it began with a truth somewhere. And by the time it reaches you, there's a whole lot of other things involved in that story that probably are not true. So old wives' fables, right? Going from house to house, talking during the day while the men are out, I don't know, hunting, doing carpentry, whatever it might be. And he says here, but exercise yourself toward godliness. Don't worry so much about all these gossiping stories. Listen, start working on godliness, holiness, living a life that's worthy and pleasing to Christ. That's really what we need to do. And he says, for bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Wow. Having the promise of a life that now is and that which is to come. So it's not saying, he's not saying bodily exercise is bad. He's saying it profits a little bit. All right, so you feel a little bit better. You might add a couple years to yourself while you're down here because you exercise. But you're not going to make it past 130. Nobody does. So we're here for a short time. And bodily exercise is only going to last that short time. But godliness... Exercising ourselves to godliness, that will follow us into eternity. So it will profit you a lot forever. And which should be more important? Yes, you can do your jumping jacks and your sit-ups and push-ups. But then do your spiritual prayer and your reading of the word of God. And start talking to the Lord whom you love and who loves you and walk with him every day. Learn from him for he is meek and lowly of heart and he asked you to learn from him and that's what we should be doing, beloved. He goes on and he says here, 
For this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. And it should be. It should be. Because we do need to grow in our spiritual life. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. So Paul says this is a faithful saying. It is worthy of all acceptance, right? About godliness and, and, and living our lives in godliness. And he says, you know, for to this end, it's because of this. For, for to this end, we labor and we suffer reproach. We work on, on our holiness every day, but we also suffer reproach from all those around us, right? We suffer big time reproach simply for being Christians. And he says, why do we suffer the reproach? Because we trust in the living God. We trust in the living God who's the savior of all men. We preach Jesus and we're gonna not be liked. See, everybody is okay. If, if, if I got into a crowd of people and somebody started talking about what, they, what their idea of God is, everybody would be interested. Everybody would have a little, their own view, you know, I believe God is, you know, is just pure love. And I believe God is, you know, reaching out to all the hurting in the world. Everybody would have different views of God and his attributes and, and who he is, what he's like. But the minute somebody brings up Jesus Christ, everyone gets a little nervous. Oh, well, you know. Um, well, I mean, right, but there's God and the Muslims and the, and the, the Hindus and the, you know, and the, uh, all the other groups out there, you know, they don't really see Jesus as anything important. So, you know, we don't want to narrow things down a bit. Is Jesus God? Yes. And what did our Lord say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so by its very nature, Christianity has an exclusive truth claim. No other option. Jesus didn't say, I am the way and Buddha is the way and Muhammad is the way and Joe... Smith down the road is the way and he said I am the way the truth and the life no man or woman comes to the father but through me so that's an exclusive truth claim now this does not mean that we can't appreciate the sincerity of other faiths that we can't appreciate the individuals and people of these other faiths. I just can't believe that faith because I'm a Christian and I believe in Christ. But it doesn't mean I can't dialogue or talk to other individuals about what they believe. And I do quite often, I do that. Uh, and I've never felt like I've had to compromise my faith and nor has anyone who's talked to me felt like they've had to compromise their belief. We just learned from each other, that's all. We'd sit and we'd learn, we'd talk, I'd get a better understanding of what they believe and why, and they would get the same with me. But do I believe Jesus is the way to God? You betcha I do, because he is God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that. Uh, and if people ask me what I believe, I will tell them that doesn't mean you're a hater and it doesn't mean you um, discount people and their beliefs. I don't. 
I often go out to lunch with a friend of mine who's a Muslim imam. I remember the first day we met, somebody had wanted us to go out and have lunch together. And it was the first time I've ever met a Muslim imam. And it was actually one of the few times he ever met a clergyman, Christian clergyman. He was from Pakistan. And so I remember when we met at the restaurant. And I saw him and he saw me. And the first thing he said to me is, you're not going to convert me. And I looked right at him and said, you're not going to convert me either. And he said, good, let's have lunch. <laughs> Pass me the rice. And I passed him the rice. And we, we both laughed. And then we, we had a great lunch. We talked to each other about things. It, it, was, it was this kind of this reticent fear in the beginning, wondering what's this going to be like? Are they going to try to force me to believe their opinion? And what it turns out is, is that we have some areas we agree on things, and then we have lots of areas we disagree. But we're willing to sit with each other and to talk and to have lunch and to be friends. And I think that speaks for itself, right? And that's something that we can do in this world. So will we suffer persecution? Yes. Will we be marginalized because our faith has an exclusivity claim? Sure. Do we have to be mean and not talk to other people or hate people? No. And nor, nor are we. We shouldn't be, nor are we. At least I haven't met people who are. And so Paul ends this section by saying, these things command and teach. There's an emphatic thing there. These things, Jesus is Savior, so on and so forth, command and teach. This is emphatic. And he's leaving this with Timothy to give him instruction as he goes through his pastorate in, in the city of Ephesus. Uh, very interesting. And the more I think about the things Paul wrote, it becomes obvious it's very apropos to you and me today and to our lives. So we're going to pick up here um, uh, with verse 12 tomorrow. So chapter 4, verse 12. Okay, let's say a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the teaching that you have shown us, helping us to differentiate between doctrines of demons and good doctrine, teachings that come from you and teachings that do not. And Lord, give us wisdom in how to apply what we've learned today, that we might not just grow in knowledge of you, but in the way we know you personally. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, please read ahead, and I will join you tomorrow, same time, same channel. God love you.